Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! First this morning, some say they will fight what they call a soft Brexit, but now there's an attempt by those who campaign for Britain to remain in the EU to allow the British people to change their minds, possibly with a second referendum before Brexit is complete. The Labour MEP, Richard Corbett, is revealed this morning to have tried to amend uh, European Parliament resolutions. Uh, the original resolution called on the European Parliament to respect the will of the majority of the citizens of the United Kingdom to leave the EU, which Mr Corbett proposed to change to, to respect the will of the majority of those who voted in the recent referendum in the United Kingdom to leave the EU. He also proposed removing the wording, stress that this wish must be respected, but adding, while taking account of the 48.1% who wish to remain in it. The amendments were proposed in October, but they were rejected by a vote in the Brussels Constitutional Committee earlier this month. The report will be voted on by all MEPs in the Parliament in February. Joining me now from Leeds is the Labour MEP who proposed the amendments, Richard Corbett. Good morning, Mr uh, Corbett. Thanks Good for morning. joining us, because it's quite a short notice. I mean, is, is your aim to try and reverse what happened on June the 23rd? Well, my aim in, with those amendments was simply factual. It's, it's rather odd that these amendments of uh, two months ago are suddenly newspaper headlines in three very different newspapers, The Express, The Sun and The Telegraph, on the same day. It smacks of a, a sort of concerted effort to uh, try and uh, slap down any notion that Britain might perhaps want to rethink its position on Brexit as the cost of Brexit emerges. But you would like us to rethink our position even before the cost has emerged, wouldn't you? Well, there, there are many people, I get lots of letters of people who say, well, hang on a minute, this was an advisory referendum won by a narrow majority on the basis of a pack of lies and a questionable mandate. But if there is a mandate from this referendum, it's surely to secure a Brexit that works for Britain without sinking the economy. But and if it transpires as we move forward that this is going to be a very costly exercise, then there will be people who voted leave who will say, hang on a minute, this is not what I was told. I was told it would save money. We could put it in the NHS. But if it's going to cost us an arm and a leg, then I would like the right to reconsider. But your aim is not to get a Brexit that would work for Britain. Your aim is to stop Brexit, isn't it? Well, if we could get a Brexit that works for Britain, that would respect <coughs> the outcome of the referendum if you accept that the referendum gives a mandate for that. But, you don't. but if we don't get that, if we can't get that, if it's going to be a disaster, if it's going to be costly, if it's going to cost people jobs, if it's going to cost Britain money, it's something that we might want to pause and rethink. Now, the government said it's going to come forward with a plan. That's good. We need to know what options we want to go for as a country. Do we want to stay in the single market, in the customs union? Do we want to stay in the various EU agencies, in Europol and so on? But those options should be costed so that we can all see how much the cost of Brexit is going to be. If you were simply trying to make the resolutions more legal, which I think is what you said, mm -hmm. why did the Constitutional Committee vote them down? Well, this is a report by Mr. Verhofstadt about mm. future treaty amendments for the European Union down the road in years to come. It wasn't the main focus of the report. This was a, a, a side reference in which he'd put up the idea of association partnerships for countries outside the European Union. So are you and going to push for these changes when it comes before the full parliament? I, I first need to see what the text that is put before the full parliament was. It was only voted in committee last week. We've not had the full text yet. I mean, you said in September that there is the widespread view in uh, UK Labour that if the Brexit deal is bad, <coughs> we shouldn't exclude a rethink. By rethink, I, mm -hmm. I would take it you would mean another referendum. When you were laying down these uh, referenda, these amendments, was this just uh, uh, acting on your own initiative or acting on behalf of the Labour Party? No, I'm just a humble, lame duck MEP. I'm, I don't speak <laughs> well, for the Labour Party. Leader, as such, you're deputy Labour but, leader. Uh, in, the, in the European Parliament, yes. Yeah. But, it, but it's, it makes sense, doesn't it, from any point of view, that if the course of action you've embarked on turns out 
to be much more costly and disastrous than you'd anticipated, that you might want a chance to think again. You might come to the same conclusion, sure. of course, but you but, might think, ooh, whoa, wait a minute, let's, let's have another look at this. But just to be clear, even though you are deputy leader of Labour in the European Parliament, you are acting alone and not as Labour Party policy. I'm acting as the Labour member on the Constitutional Affairs Committee, which is the responsible committee in the European Parliament. Yeah, but and was it I'm for doing, the party or just yourself? All I'm doing is stating things that are common sense, <laughs> that if, yeah. as we move forward, this turns out to be a disaster, yeah. then we need to look very carefully at where we're going. But if a deal is done under Article 50, mm -hmm. and we get to see the shape of that deal by the beginning of 2019, under the two-year timetable, in your words, we won't know if it's a disaster or not until it's implemented. We won't be able to tell until we see the results, whether it's good or bad, surely. Well, we might well be able to, because that Article 50 divorce agreement has, under Article 50, to be made in uh, taking account of the future framework of relations with the European Union, to quote that article of the treaty. That means we should have some idea about wh what that's going to be like. Are we going to be outside the customs union, for instance, which will be very damaging for our economy? Or are we staying inside, no, you, you, but you, having you, to follow the rules without that, having a say on them? You, you claim know, I, that, either but way. we won't know till we, if and until we do leave the customs union. You think it'll be damaging, others think mm -hmm. it'll give us an opportunity to do massive trade deals. My case this morning is not who's right or wrong. We won't know if it's good or bad until we've seen the results. We will know a heck of a lot more than we do now when we see that Article 50 divorce agreement. We'll know the terms of the divorce. We'll know how much we still have to pay into the EU budget for legacy costs. We will know what, whether we're going to aim to be in the single market and customs union or not. Okay. We will know about the agencies. We will know a lot of things. And if the deal on the table looks as though it will be damaging to Britain, then Parliament will be within its rights to say, wait a minute, not this deal. All and right. then you either renegotiate or you re reconsider the whole issue of Brexit okay. or you find some other solution. We need to uh, leave it there, Mr. Cobb, but thank you for joining us this morning going over these uh, matters. Uh, Ian Martin, how serious is the attempt to, uh, in effect, unwind what happened on June the 23rd? I think it's pretty serious, and I think that, that interview illustrates very well the most damaging impact of the approach taken by a lot of Remainers, which is to essentially say with one breath, we of course accept the result, but then in, with every action subsequent to that to try and undermine the result or try and ensure that the deal is as bad as possible. I think what needed to happen and hasn't happened after June the 23rd is that you have the extremists on both sides and you have in the middle probably 70 percent of public opinion most politicians in the country moderate leavers moderate remainers should be working together to try and get a decent british bespoke deal but moderate leavers are not going to take moderate remainers seriously if this is the approach if the approach is to undermine at every single turn to tr try and rerun the referendum it, Helen, i didn't quite get a clear-cut answer i don't think to whether he in any way represented mm. Labour policy. No, I, d I think that was a question that was ducked quite successfully, and I, I don't see that this is Labour Party policy. I, I do partly agree with Ian, actually, about the fact that most people are in a kind of morass in the middle, and actually the, the extremes of both sides are doing neither side of favours. From my perspective, on someone on the other side, I think that you know, the sort of screaming that happens whenever anybody dares to kind of question or suggest that you might ever want to think again about these things, you know, I disagree with him about having another referendum, but if he wants to campaign for that, that is something that is absolutely his democratic right to do so. If he can convince enough people, that's a good idea, then he succeeded. But the idea that we will do a deal and then realise, well, this is a really bad deal, uh, let's not proceed, we won't really know that until the deal is implemented. What our access is to the single market, whether or not we are in or out of the customs union, which we're going to talk about in, in a, a minute, what immigration policy we will have, whether these are going to be good things or bad things, surely you've got to wait for four, five, six years mm -hmm. to see whether it's worked or not. 
Yes, of course, by which stage Parliament will have already voted on it and there'll be absolutely no going back on it all then, or maybe there will be, but I think the debate is going to be for the here and now. We're talking really about the first three months of 2019. That is absolutely the moment where Parliament either agrees with Theresa May mm. or refuses it. One arch-Romaniac I, I spoke to once, I didn't take him too Arch seriously. Arch-Romaniac. Arch-Romaniac. Romaniac. Oh, suggested well. <laughs> that Theresa May may struggle to get a very good deal at all, may bring the deal to Parliament in the beginning of 2019 and say, here is the best we can possibly get, because I've tried every mm -hmm. sinew to get a brilliant one, and I recommend <coughs> that we reject it, which I think is incredibly unlikely. What's he on, or she? Uh, some sort of uh, very strong chemical drugs. But <laughs> the, the, the point is, it's highly unlikely, but all manner of things could happen. Right. Uh, I don't think any of this is taken hugely seriously for now, but... The future is a very long way away. Let's uh, stick with this for the moment because earlier the International Trade Secretary, Liam Fox, was asked whether we would stay in the customs union after Brexit. Let's just have a listen to what he had to say. There are, would be limitations mm. on what we could do in terms of tariff setting, which would limit what kind of deals you would do. That's quite correct. But we want to look at all the different things. It's not binary. I hear people yep. talking about hard Brexit and soft Brexit, though it's a boiled egg we're talking about. It's a little more complex. Um, so Turkey, for example, is in part of the customs union, but not other parts. What we need to do to, to before we make final this decisions is, very, this is, is very to look at the cost. Now, this is what I've picked up. The government knows it cannot remain a member of the single market uh, in these negotiations because that would still make us subject to free movement and the European Court. <coughs> the customs union and the Prime Minister's office doesn't seem to be quite as binary. That there are, you can be a little bit in and a bit out. But I would suggest that overall, Liam Fox knows that to do all the free trade deals he wants to do, we basically have to be out. But what he also seems to know is that it, that's an, a minority view in the Cabinet, or certainly it's not one that Theresa May... I mean, he said he wasn't going to kind of give his opinion publicly, he was going to argue it privately. Well, because there's still an argument going on in Cabinet about it. Yeah, and I, you do get that general sense. When David Liddington struggled a little against mm. Emily Thornbury at PMQ, she used all six questions to mm. say, are we going to stay in the customs mm. union? And what became apparent was that Theresa May hasn't told him what to think about that subject yet. Mm. So that's what I got from that interview. But. If, if we stay in the customs union any meaningful way, we cannot do our own free trade deals. That, that's the, that's the, the fact is we're behind the customs union, the tariff barriers set by Europe. Not quite. Uh, Turkey is proof in the pudding who have some, albeit very limited exemptions there within the customs union on most mm. things, but they can do free trade deals with their neighbours. Well, not on goods they cannot do that. They've done free trade deals, mm. they're doing one with Pakistan at the moment. It involves foreign direct investment and some services mm. and other matters of trade. But Europe negotiates on Turkey's behalf on the major free trade deals. Th th this is absolutely why Customs Union is going to be the fault line for the deal we try and achieve, and, and the Cabinet will have to come to a view. Interesting, I thought Liam Fox actually suggested during the Mara interview that he was prepared to suck up whatever the Cabinet No, I think to. what he was saying was that this is still an argument and he intends to win it, yeah. that he wants to leave the Customs Union in effect maybe still have half a foot in it, but he wants to leave it because he wants to do these free trade deals. Yeah, th there is an argument within the Cabinet about precisely that. But I think the other thing to consider is, and we maybe in this country we've tended to, for obvious reasons since the referendum, to focus too much on the British angle in negotiations, but I think the negotiations are going to be very difficult. You look at the state of the EU at the moment, you look at what else is happening in Italy, in France, Indeed. in Germany, look at the 27. It's actually possible, I think, that we could, we could sensibly, Britain could design a bespoke, sensible deal, but it then becomes very difficult to agree, which is why I ultimately think we're heading for a harder Brexit. Oh, that thought, because in the year ahead, we're going to be looking at Europe and how important it is to developments in this country now. I've been getting away with it all.